the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. So I decided to interrupt the prayer series because I noticed on the feed comments from a lot of people who I consider to be good-hearted, well-intentioned, earnest people of faith who think that they're not. People of faith who, you know, hopefully would aspire to, to be, to be, you know, carrying out Christ's great commission, go into all the world and preach the good news to every creature. And yet they find themselves stifled and, and, and I think unable to completely embody their faith and step out into their faith. And what we see is the nature of the stifling is everything from kind of self-doubt and anxiety right the way through to extreme PTSD, self-harm, self-abuse, chronic addiction, addiction to sex, addiction to alcohol, addiction to who knows what. People who otherwise would be great ambassadors for faith who find themselves cowering. Now, I'm not suggesting in this film that Christ in any way sought to relinquish us from personal responsibility and accountability. In fact, um, I'm going to be making a film later using verses and things Christ said that clearly show that, that he was doing the opposite, that it was about taking responsibility. But scripture clearly tells us that there are creative, intelligent, supernatural beings that are in, that have forever been in rebellion against God and are mortally hostile to humanity, to mankind. What, what Paul calls in Ephesians the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, it seems to me, not everybody, but it seems to me we as a, as a, as a generation and maybe as, a, as an epoch, we've lost that supernatural worldview. As the clip in the film says, you know, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he doesn't exist. You know, you live in a different world. We have some real serious problems here, and this is not solving them. Satan's greatest trick was convincing man he didn't exist. And what I want to do is I want to rediscover that supernatural worldview and use that rediscovery to show how if you're, if you're under oppression of any sort from a hostile entity that is seeking to thwart your faith, that hostile entity, those hostile entities, all of them, they have no authority over you anymore. Christ took that authority away with a piece of wood and four nails. He disarmed them at the cross. He took away their authority. And my plan today is to go through scripture and look at how Christ dealt with them. Because my, my reading of scripture, my reading of Christ dealing with the demonic, he dealt with them all the same way. Apart from one, one slight exception, but in a way it's the exception that proves the rule. He dealt with them all the same way. He dealt them all in simple language. And he gave you authority to do the same. And that's what we're going to look at today. Now where we're going to start today is we're going to, we're going to lay a little bit of a foundation and a few premise. The first one is that, that in my, my understanding is that God cannot be hurt. God cannot be harmed. However, God created mankind and created humanity in his image. And that's a point we need to hold on to because we're going to come back to that right at the end because it's vital. God cares for you 
in an extraordinarily vast and complete way. And you see, demons, those forces hostile to God, in rebellion against God, they can't hurt God, but they can hurt what he created. They can hurt you. And when when you're hurting, God knows it. God, in a way, feels it or... or <clears throat> It's their way of getting to God, one of them. And the other thing they have to do, because of what Christ did at the cross, the next step, if you like, is is the fullness of the Gentiles. Well, the fullness of the Gentiles is the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the good news to every creature. That's the Great Commission. And when that's complete, the next step happens in the eschaton that, you know, the end times begins. It's not a coincidence that the return of the Lord is linked in Scripture yeah. to a concept called the fullness of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. The fullness of the Gentiles is about the nations being reclaimed through the gospel. So I get asked a lot, well, are, are like the powers of darkness, are they just kind of dumb? You know, like they really think they can win or... You know, it's like, okay, they know who God is. They know they're not him. Mm -hmm. Let's just establish that. They're not idiots. But they also know that the return of the Lord and their final judgment, because the return of the Lord is linked to the day of the Lord as well, when everything is, you know, all the wrongs are set right and, 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 the, and the righteous are vindicated, all that stuff. They know that, that when the day of the Lord comes, it's up for them. Time's up. But the day of the Lord is also linked to the second coming, which is linked to the fullness of the Gentiles, the reclaiming. So they are trying; they are attempting to prolong. They're, that that that's my view. I think that's wow. the view. Wow! Trying to stretch this that thing out. Victory, <laughs> victory for them means delaying the, the the return of the Lord, delaying their own judgment for as long as they possibly can. And the way you do that is to thwart the expansion of the kingdom of God, and the mm. kingdom of God grows through the dissemination. Of the gospel as people are one you know to christ in other words jesus knew what he was doing when he gave the great commission and that makes warfare make sense spiritual exactly. warfare finally exactly. makes sense with that worldview as one kingdom grows the other diminishes you know and we like to quote the great commission at verse 19 go ye therefore and teach all you know all that we skip verse 18 all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth Okay, there's a reason Jesus says that. Hmm, hmm. There's a reason why the book of Acts <laughs> plays out as it does in terms of cosmic geography. Again, I, all of this is in unseen realm, you know, but spiritual warfare is about growing one kingdom so that the other one diminishes, you know, un until, until God decides we're good now. Yeah. You know, if only God can define the fullness of the Gentiles and the day that triggers the day of the Lord, the return of the Christ, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But as long as they can keep that from happening. And so the demons, their, their sentence has already been passed. They know they can't win. But what they can do is delay that sentence being carried out. And how they do that is they thwart the advance of the kingdom of heaven. And they do that by attacking you. Because if you're a person of faith, the last thing they need is for you to embody your faith because if all of us embody our faith, the advance of the kingdom of heaven speeds up. And the, and the longer they can delay that, the longer they get time. About what the resurrected Christ did at the time of his ascension, he went to this, this spiritual prison and proclaimed his victory over the demonic forces, the same victory we read about in Colossians 2, 11 through 15, and I think this was a way of encouraging the people to whom Peter is writing, saying, look, you do not have to live in fear of the demonic. Um, Jesus himself has, uh, pro has conquered them by his death and resurrection. And at the time of his ascension to the right hand of the Father, he proclaimed his victory. Um, and you need to take strength and courage and confidence from that, from that truth. And so we're going to look at at how Christ dealt with the demonic, and therefore how you can. Firstly, the writers of the Gospels, they, they took it upon themselves. They, they had five or six different 
names for these, what Paul calls the evil forces of, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. They had five or six names. In the Greek from the um, diamon, translated demon, diamonion, translated kind of de demon or heathen god, um, right the way through to pneumatikos akathatos, the unclean spirit or the, the um, impure spirit, right the way through to the pneumatikos poneria, the evil spirit. And then obviously we have the, in Hebrew, the Hasatan, the Satan, the devil character, the accuser, um, some in the proper noun and some like in the book of Job as, as the accuser. So a, a accuser rather than the devil. And so, and, and, and that there, there appears to be within that a kind of hierarchy. But the most beautiful and important part is that Christ dealt with them all the same way. It didn't matter where they were in the hierarchy. Christ dealt with them all the same way. And Christ gave you authority to do the same. Now, the other place I want to look um, before we launch into how Christ did it and the words he used <clears throat> is is what I think is a really, really important, when dealing with the demonic, is a really important single verse in Scripture. And it's probably not the verse you'd expect. It's in the first chapter of Mark. And it's the transitional verse. It's Christ going from the, the introduction. Mark introduces us to, to Christ, Jesus, and his ministry. And then the ministry goes, um, shall we, slightly on the road. And it takes off. However, there's a verse. And the verse is, 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 is so simple. It's Mark 1.39. And he, Jesus, and he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. And then we're launched into the itinerant part of Christ's ministry. Now, if you look at that, so Mark has introduced Christ in his, 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 his theological background with a quote from Isaiah. Then he's... He's introduced John the Baptist. Christ has gone to John the Baptist, been baptized, come up out of the water, saw heaven torn apart, spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. And he is then compelled, driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Now, that word's important. We're going to come back to that shortly. Compelled, driven. And in the Greek, the root of the word is, is, is the verb ekbalo. So Christ is, is, is compelled into the wilderness, driven by, by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Then he comes back out of the wilderness, meets Simon, brother Andrew, James and John in the synagogue, um, gives the most amazing sermon. All the people were astonished. All the people were amazed. A man possessed by a demon starts shouting at him. Jesus rebukes him, cast out the demon. And then Christ goes to Simon Peter's house. His mother-in-law is ill in bed with a fever. He heals her. Then all the people from the town and the villages, they bring all the sick and the demon possessed. Christ heals, 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 heals. The next morning, he goes off into the wilderness to pray on his own. They come and find him. They're like, Rabbi, teacher, there's a whole town waiting for you. You've got to come back and do your job. And he's like, no, 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 I've got to go this way. So he, he always goes where the spirit drives him. And then Mark writes this verse. Then he, Jesus, went throughout all of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. And then the next line is, a leper came to him and on his knees begged him, if you are willing, make me clean. Okay, back up. Now, in my opinion, Mark is a genius writer. He doesn't waste words. He doesn't mince words. He says what he means. Very, very precise. Now, that strikes me. We know, we know Christ in our, in our times today. We know Christ as the healer teacher. And here is Mark talking about a pivotal verse, the introduction of Christ, everything we know about Christ in the early part, to his itinerant ministry, to him reaching out and, and doing signs and wonders off the scale. And this one pivotal verse, it doesn't mention healing. Now Mark, he uses, he precisely uses exactly the words he means, in my opinion. Therefore, if he's left out healing, in that verse, I think that's relevant. He says, Christ went throughout Galilee, 
preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Why didn't he mention healing? And yet, as if to to underline the absence of healing, he then said, the next line says, a leper came to him and on his knees begged him, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Christ moved with compassion, overwhelmed with compassion, touched the man, which you would never do, to touch a leper and says, I am willing, be clean. Well, that's a healing. So if, if Mark had mentioned in 139, then Jesus went throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues, healing and casting out demons. A leper came to him, on his knees begged him. And you think, okay, yeah, that underlines the healing. But because he doesn't mention healing in 139, the mentioning it in the next line almost underlines or emphasizes the fact that it's absent in the line before. So what is Mark telegraphing to us? He's saying that Christ's mission in that moment was preaching the good news of God, which is the first thing we know he did when he came out of the wilderness in the Gospel of Mark. Mark records he came out of the wilderness proclaiming the good news of God. And I think it says, um, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So that was, that was the first thing he said when he came out of the wilderness, when his, his mission started. The first two things he said. <clears throat> and so you're proclaiming the good news and casting out demons. The casting out of, the, to Mark, Mark is telegraphing to us that the casting out of demons was so important to Christ's mission. And, it, and from a certain point of view, it's so simple. Because as the scholar Michael Heiser says, who I have a lot of respect for, um... As one kingdom advances, the other one diminishes. Christ came to further the kingdom of God, or to lay the foundation, new covenant, further the kingdom of God. And casting out demons is freeing people from the oppression. And as one kingdom advances, so the other one retreats. Now, maybe our idea that, that, that the healing and casting out of the demons kind of go hand in hand, that, that may be accurate. But the gospel writers make it clear there are times when Christ healed and there are times when he cast out demons and there are times when he do both. So the conflating the two and saying, oh, well, they just had a sort of a slightly archaic view of healing and they didn't really understand disease. No, that's that. If you read the gospels, that's that's grossly inaccurate. That's that's a that's a that's a really terrible way of reading it because the gospel writers tell us he cast out demons. He did healings. Sometimes he did both concurrently and sometimes they were very separate things. So. How did Christ cast out demons? That's what we're going to look at. And that's what's going to empower you to do the same in your life. Lift yourself out of that oppression and go carry out the Great Commission en masse. Let's have a look. Now, the first thing we're going to look at is a selection of verses of Christ working in the demonic. Now, it's not exhaustive because there are so many if you look at scripture, there are so many accounts of Christ working in the demonic. But I'm just going to just look at a few of these for now. So Mark 1, 23, 26. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying out with a loud voice, came out of the man. Mark 1, 32, 34. At evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. Uh, and perhaps a better translation might be demonized, because the Greek is um, diamonizomai, uh, which is much more demonized, tormented by a demon perhaps, than, than actually occupied by a demon anyway that's a small that's a sort of splitting hairs but and those who were demon possessed demonized and the whole city was gathered together at the door then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons but he did not allow the demons to speak for they knew who he was luke 441 moreover demons came out of many people shouting you are the son of god but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Messiah. Luke 9.42 And as he, Jesus, was still coming, the demon threw him, a child, threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, 
and gave him back to his father. Matthew 8.16 When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick. Matthew 12.22 Then one was brought to him who was demonised, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Mark 9, 25-27 When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Matthew 9, 33 And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitudes marvelled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. Mark 7.29 Then he, Jesus, told her, For such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. Matthew 4.24 Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demonised, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And obviously my personal favourite, and he went throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Now if you look for all of those verses, the authors have chose many different names for the demons. They're demons, they're unclean spirits, they're impure spirits, they're evil spirits, they're spirits of infirmity, they're spirits of disability. How Christ dealt with them all, there's a pattern. And it's all pretty much the same. And that's what we're going to look at. And where I'd like to start is the Greek verb ekbalo. Now the verb ekbalo in the, in the concordance is, is, is to throw, to put out, to banish but also to bring forth and to produce. And it's often translated cast out. For example, Matthew 8, 16. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word. And Mark 1, 34. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. Mark 6, 13. And they cast out many demons. This is the apostles. And they cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick, and they healed them. Matthew 10, 8, part of Christ's direct instructions to his apostles and to us. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And Ekbalo is used by the authors even for Satan, as well as all the other types of demon. Mark 3, 22 and 23. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub. And by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. So he, Jesus, called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? It's ekbalo, or ekbalain. So we have this verb, ekbalo. But the gospel writers, demons isn't the only context that the gospel writers choose to use the Greek verb, verb ekbalo. Let's have a look. John 9.34 They, the Pharisees, answered him, this was the, the man born blind who could now see. You were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us? And they, the Pharisees, drove him out of the temple. The blind man, they drove him out of the temple. The authors use the word ekbalo, or exabalon, I think it is. Mark eleven fifteen, one of the best known pieces of scripture. So they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out all the moneylenders and those who bought and sold in the temple. Ekbalain, Matthew 9.38. Now this is lovely because this is a positive spin. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Matthew 7.5, this is a beautiful one because this is Christ, this is sarcasm. You hypocrite, first cast out the beam from your own eye before you seek to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. But without doubt, the most telling use of that Greek verb lemma, ekbalo, is in Mark 1.12. And it shows that, that this word isn't an esoteric, mystical, unusual word 
reserved only for demons and reserved only for Christ, that it is in fact an everyday word. And it, and it is also a word that can be so positive because in Mark 1.12, Mark, the author, records immediately the Holy Spirit compelled, drove Jesus into the wilderness. And he uses the verb ekbalo. Christ was cast out, put forth, sent, compelled, launched by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. I personally love compelled. But it's the same root verb. It's, it's ekbalo. It's not a mystical word. It's an everyday word. And so we can use it. Get out. Let's have a look at some, let's have a look at another word. Let's have a look at rebuked. Matthew 17, 18 says, And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. The root verb is epitomeo in the Greek. To mete out due measure, to censure. I rebuke, I chide, I admonish, I warn. And again, we can see that the root epitomeo is used everywhere in Jesus' work with demons. Mark 9, 25, 27. When Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Luke 4.41 And demons also came out of many, saying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not let them speak, because they knew he was the Christ. Luke 9.42 And as he, Jesus, was coming, the demon threw the child. Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child. But again, it's not an esoteric, unusual word reserved only for demons. It is an everyday word. And the author clearly telegraphed to us, it's just an everyday word. It's just a word meaning warn, chastise, chide, admonish, rebuke. Let's have a look. Mark 10, 13. Then they brought the little children to him, to Jesus, that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. And then Christ said, don't rebuke them, bring them to me. But the word is the root verb epitomeo. Matthew 8, 26. Now this is, this is the boat on the, on the water caught in the storm and the, the apostles will think they're going to die. But he said to them, why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. He rebuked the winds and the sea, the root verb epitomeo. And Mark's version of that event, Mark 4.39, he got up and he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And the wind died and it was completely calm. Now that's really important, the quiet, be still, seemingly the same thing, but they're two different words. And that's what we're going to look at next, the, the, the shut up. But you can see the epitomeo, the rebuking, it's an everyday word. It's not reserved for demons. It's not esoteric. It's not a mystical word. Let's look at quiet, be still. Luke 4.35, Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And the demon came out of him. And that, that Greek verb is, is, I'm going to say it wrong, fimu. Okay? Mark 4.39, we just covered it. He got up, rebuked the wind and the waves and said, quiet, be still. Now in the Greek, they use two different words. He, use, he uses the Greek verb syopeo, forgive my pronunciation, and the root of the fimu. Now, one is silent and one is be silent. So one is, one is to tell someone to shut up and be silent. But the other one, the fimu, has a more proactive kind of element. It's, it's to put something to silence or to render it silent. And one possible usage of it is, I muzzle. So Mark 4.39 seemingly has the author using two very, very similar words successively in the Greek one after the other. And it seems like Christ would not, may not have only silenced the storm, but then rendered it silent, muzzled it, bound it into silence. It's, it's not just telling someone to be silent, but commanding silence from them in an authoritative way, in a way that they can't... It, it, 
I mean, forgive me, but it puts me in mind of of the Matrix films where, um, you know, Neo is in the interrogation and the agent says, what good is a phone call if you're unable to speak? Mr. Anderson. And it's, the hint is that he's not just saying you're not allowed to speak, you actually can't. And the sense here is that Christ rendered the wind and the waves silent. He bound them to silence. And so the same with the demons. It's not just be silent, like a again, back to my pub landlord, you shut up. But actually, I mean, again, forgive me, but it's got that it's got that slightly sort of it's commanding, it's rendering it un, it's it's not only making it silent, but it's rendering it unable to speak. Binding it to silence. And the authors are clearly telegraphing us that that's what Christ did. And of course, it's impossible for that to not put us in mind of Matthew 18, 18, um, where Christ is recorded as saying, you know, truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, if you bind something, if you, if you render something thus, it is rendered. Now, the next place I want to look is is in the wilderness, actually, and Christ with Satan. Because I think this is really, really important because, you know, in case anyone's out there is thinking, yeah, but like they're demons, but but Satan. And it's like Christ dealt with them the same way. And and the word is, is go away or get behind me. And so it's Matthew 4.10. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Now, the Greek verb is hupago, and it's away with you, uh, to lead away, to lead on slowly, to depart. Go away, be gone. And so, away with you, Satan. And yet, the writers show us that Christ's use of the word hupago, uh, hupage, um, Christ says it to a leper, Mark one forty four. He just healed the leper, and then he says, you know, don't tell anyone about this, but but go, show yourself to the priests. Well, that's not a negative. He's sending him to the priests with the healing. Um, in Mark five thirty four, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Hupago. Get behind me, Satan. Hupago. Go in peace. Hupago. It's the same word. Luke ten three. Go. Behold, I send you out as lambs amongst wolves. Hupago. John 3, 8. And this is, this is Christ talking to Nicodemus about the movement of the spirit and, and, and the wind. And it goes where it goes. And he says, no one knows from and where it is going. It's the root word hupago. John eight twenty two, as he says about his crucifixion and ascension, where I am going, you cannot follow. John 16, 17, because I go to the Father. So the, the root verb, hupago, it's not a mystical word. When he says to, to Satan, get behind me, go, get out, leave, he's just using an everyday word. And a word that could be seen negative, could be seen positive, depends on the context, as we've just seen. And in Matthew 16, 23, he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, you are an offence to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. And it's the same root word. Get behind me, Satan. Hupago. And the last of this collection of authoritative commands that you can use against demons that are not mystical words. They're straightforward language that the demons have to listen to in the name of God or in the name of Christ. Shut up. Be silent. Get out. Leave me alone. And the last one is, is come out or get out. Mark 5, 8. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Mark 1, 25. Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. Mark 9, 25. He rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Luke four thirty five. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. So hopefully you're left with this, this sense that if you feel in any way that you may be oppressed by a demon, 
that you may be, that, that, that your self-doubt isn't all you, that actually something's whispering in your ear. I mean, I personally believe there are, there are demons of, of suicidal ideation, there are demons of self-doubt and anxiety constantly looking to, to seek, seek a, a chink in your armour and whisper negative thoughts, doubt, you're not capable, you're not able. In the making of this film, which has been weeks and possibly months, the amount of, of, of attack I've come under with self-doubt and anxiety, and I shouldn't be doing this, I can't be doing this, this will never work. It's, it's been quite remarkable. And every time I just had to take it on, face on, and put the camera on and sit in front of it. So really, I really want you to take to heart that what Christ did and the language he used was common everyday language. And I like to think of a pub landlord, I worked in a pub, of a, a good pub landlord just being like, no, you, unacceptable, shut up, get out, don't come back. Very, very straightforward. Shut up. Leave me alone. In the name of God, get away from me. So where I want to look next is, is, is in the realm of authority. The authority that Christ gave to you over demons. And the authority that Christ stripped away from demons at the cross. The first place we're going to look is Mark 3, 11 to 15. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. And Ephesians 6.12 tells us, you know, the, the epistle of Paul for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual rulers, authorities, cosmic powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So maybe that means you can start to rebuke that which you know is not right to do. Get behind me, Satan. Get away from me, spirit of doubt. Get away from me, spirit of anxiety. Get away from me, spirit of pattern of habit of, 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 of addiction. And I really mean severely rebuking what Paul calls the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And I would say be brutal with them because scripture tells us at crucifixion, resurrection, ascension and seated at the right hand of God, they have no authority over you anymore. Christ disarmed them. Christ took away their authority. The only authority they can possibly have is that which you give them, if you give in to them. And as James says in his epistle, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And the passage I love is Colossians 2, 13, 15. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record of the charges against you and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Hallelujah. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. Disarmed. An enemy without a weapon is no longer an enemy. They're just a vague threat. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And if there was one event in history where every single demon was present, it would have been the crucifixion because they thought they'd won. The parable of the tenants and the vineyard, they would have all been there because they thought this is it. The heir is about to die. We've won. And they missed the small print, which was no at, this, at, at the point of death of Christ, all your authority will be rescinded. God has taken back all of the nations, all authority. They lost and they know it. Bring it up with them. You were there at the cross. You, you saw. You, you were cheering it on. You thought you would won and you lost. You were disarmed. Your authority is removed. Get away from me. In the name of Christ, you have no authority any more over me. 
And, and the, there are verses which are important where you'll read it, it says, Christ commanded the Spirit and it left. But actually, if you if you look at um, the Greek verb, it's the that present imperative verb tense, which uh, I, we mentioned before with the um, ask and it shall be given to you, is actually it's ask and keep on asking. It's it's a continuous action. Well, it's the same verb with, with, with Christ. He commanded the Spirit and it left. A better translation would probably be, he commanded the Spirit until it left. Which I can't remember which text that was. I can't either right now. But yeah, it says Jesus was was commanding the demon to leave. And if we pre sometimes we got to be careful. Those who are Greek scholars watching this will obviously be saying, "Wait a minute, Sam. Be sure and you tell warn them." We we need to be careful not to press Greek tenses beyond what they intend. At the same time, let's not ignore them. I think this is a case where it's significant. I think it's telling us that Jesus repeatedly was telling the demon to go. So I tell people it's not so much tell the demon and it will go. It's tell the demon until it goes. Hmm. Be persistent. Just be brutal with them. Get out. Get away from me. You have no authority in the name of God. Be gone. And if you want to know a really, really verse they don't like, a really nasty verse they really don't like. And it's such a beautiful verse. It's Genesis 127. Um, in the Hebrew, I think it's Vavra Elohim et ha Adam bat Salem of Basalem Elohim bara. And God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. You were created in the image of God. You were created to be an image bearer of God. They weren't. They hate that. That's why they're jealous. They have no authority. And if you want, the big guns is, I was created in the image of God. Who are you in the name of God? Get away from me. And then beautifully, Jesus himself references this. And I, it's a stunning verse in this context or stunning passage. It's Mark 12, 14 to 17, where they ask in Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? They're trying to trick him. But he knows their hypocrisy and says to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. Bring me a coin. So they brought it. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is on this coin? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said, Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and give to God that which is God's. And they marveled at him. And the reason is, whose image and inscription? The Greek is... Uh, Icon, 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 whose image? I think we get the word icon from it. And inscription, um, epigraphe, whose icon and epigraphe is on this coin. Whose image and inscription? Well, Caesar's. So give it to Caesar. What the great teacher, the rabbi doesn't do is he doesn't finish the lesson. He lets the, he lets the listener finish the lesson because the next question from the Pharisees or anyone listening would be, should be, well, on what is God's image and inscription? But they knew the answer. You. The coin had Caesar's image, a con, and epigraphe, inscription. What bears God's image and inscription? You do. That's what Christ was saying. You bear the image of God. You belong to God. Demons haven't got a chance when you believe that and when you embody that and when you talk to them from that authority. You were made in the image of God. Walk like it. We have no fear of demons or the devil because they have already been defeated by Jesus at the cross. They are disarmed. Now, there are some worthy theological cautions to be aware of and take into account. Acts tells us, um, Acts 19, 13 to 16, um, some Jews went about driving out evil spirits and tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were de demonized. And they would say, in the name of the Jesus who Paul preaches, I command you. And um, the evil spirit said, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? And the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them and gave them such a beating. Now implied within that is that is that they, they, they didn't embody 
the name. If you've not seen my film on, you know, embodying the name of God and the name of Christ, then please have a look at that film. It, it's so much more than just, you know, the name tag. It's like embodying the name, embodying the image of God, and then speaking from that. And they, they weren't doing that. They were just lip service. Mark 9, 38 to 40 demonstrates that. Now, John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. And Jesus said, Do not forbid him. For no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil about me. For he who is not against us is on our side. In short, to quote Indiana Jones, is, is it for your glory or for God's? Ask yourself, why do you seek the cup of Christ? Is it for his glory or for yours? Now, there's two places I want to look uh, to end this. Is is firstly a place that we're going to get perhaps some, some kickback from people, and it's it's Mark nine twenty nine. It's the bit that records the apostles were trying to cast out a demon, they failed, and Christ says this type of demon can only be cast out by prayer. Now, some later scriptures say prayer and fasting, but the every early man's manuscript we have just says just by prayer. Things things that should be noticed: one, this is an exception clearly an exception. It's the only time Jesus states anything other than his authority and faith is required. Secondly, despite Jesus's assertion in the verse that has to be cast out by prayer, what Jesus actually did was do exactly what he did with all the other demons. He just cast it out. And so maybe at the point of the cross, um, even that, you know, you could even consider, well, no. I mean, I, I think what, what it says to me is, just get rid of them. And if you do happen to meet one that can't go, then it's it's by it's with prayer as well. Well, then, you know, get yourself a prayer circle and join in and gang up on it. So I see this very much as the exception, not the rule, and not something that should, should stand in your way. Because even though we have that verse, Jesus never again mentions a requirement for prayer when freeing someone from oppression of, of a demon. And in his later instruction to cast out demons in Matthew 10, 7 to 10, it's not brought up or added as a prerequisite. It seems, it seem, from there, it seems only his faith and authority is required. So because of that, I don't see it as a limiting verse. But what's also noteworthy in this particular case, and I think it's really important, leads into my last point, is that, is that in this casting out, Jesus not only cast the demon out, but he commanded it not to return. Enter him no more. And I kind of, I kind of love that idea. When you're working in the demonic, don't just don't just cast it out. When you send it into the, what, what scripture calls the waterless places, tell it and don't come back. And that brings us to the very, very last point to seal this in, is, is if you find yourself... Um, getting rid of your own demons or the demons of another. And when you get rid of them, tell them not to come back. I think it's Matthew 12, 43, 45, where Jesus says, when an unclean spirit passes out of a man, it goes through the waterless places seeking rest. And if it can't find the rest, it it takes the opportunity, goes back to where it was, back to its original home, you, and sees if, if there's an opportunity and if there is, it goes back and it brings with it seven other demons and the situation of the person is worse than the first. What does that mean to us? Well, it means in a way that, that if you get rid of something, then, then you need to also look at your behavior. So if, if, for example, I don't know, you might be a member of a WhatsApp group where occasionally some of the messages are a little bit risque and they make you uncomfortable. Well, if you've just cast out a demon of, of, of a habit or of uh, an addiction, um, and then there's a group where occasionally the odd message goes around and it's a bit risky, leave the group. Because otherwise what you're doing is you're, you're, you're getting rid of something and then you're telling it not to come back and then you're leaving a slight crack in the door open. Or you're, you're occasionally opening the door a fraction and the demons will look for a crack in the door. They have nowhere to go. So if they see a crack in the door open you know, they might well come back. And if they do, don't deal with it how I see people try to deal with that, which is which is they then try to, you know, 
close the door, and they then try to adjust their behavior. Don't do that, because you close the door and adjust your behavior. You know, you might be sealing the demon in, metaphorically. If you think that's what's happened, step one, get rid of it. Cast the demon out. Get it gone first. Then shut the door, then adjust your behavior. Not the other way around. And the tendency is to, to do the other way around. We feel like we should do something. Yeah, we should. Get rid of the demon. Get it out of you. Get it away from you. Then shut the door. Then leave the group. Then, then you might have a partner who you know, who likes watching the odd horror movie. And actually it makes you deeply uncomfortable. And you think maybe that's that's how demons got in when you were young. You don't know. And suddenly to protect the relationship, you know, you're like, oh, oh okay, I'll sit through this. It'll be okay. No, you have to make a decision. You have to shut the doors, but get rid of the demon first. And if it comes back, don't beat yourself up. Don't give yourself a hard time. Give it a hard time. Get rid of it first. Then shut the door. Then adjust your behavior. And I love, I love something that a, a clergy friend of mine said recently that when I was, I was helping her with the concept of, and don't come back, telling the demons, and don't come back. She said when she first um, applied that, when she first did that, it was as if she said she could hear it echo through eternity. It was like it echoed through the heavenly realms, like uh, uh, Maximus speaks of in The Gladiator, you know, what you do in life echoes through eternity. When you say to a demon on earth, and don't come back with authority, that, that command echoes through the heavenly realms. So use it. And then armed with this authority, armed with this knowledge of scripture, you can get rid of your own demons and you can start to get rid of the demons of others. And then you can start to do the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the good news to every creature. Armed with the knowledge that should any self-doubt, fear, anxiety, habit, addiction start to creep in your way, take it on. Get rid of it, get it out of you, get it away from you, and then continue with the Great Commission. Because that is what the demons fear. Now, what are we told to do? We are tasked not with you know, going out and doing you know, strange rituals and yelling at demons and all this kind of stuff. What are, what are they scared of? I'll tell you what they're scared of. They're scared of the kingdom of God. They fear you spreading the kingdom of heaven and they will do anything they can to stop you and you have authority to tell them get out in the name of god leave me alone and don't come back well this has been real educational but i don't believe in the devil you should he believes in you 